Chalk History Festival special series on history with Jackson. Hello and welcome to History of Jackson, the home of accessible and digestible history. And welcome to our Chalk History Festival special series. We'll be talking to some of the historians, living historians and performers here at Chalk about what they're doing at the festival and their work. Now, Chalk History Festival will be covered comprehensively through History of Jackson, be it on our social media, our blog, and our podcast. So if you wanted to check out more and learn more about what's happening at Chalk, do head to the links in the description below. Now, without further ado, I'll leave you to our Chalk History Festival special series episode. So hello and welcome to the Chalk History Festival special series here on History of Jackson. And we're joined by Jonathan Wilson. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? No, I'm doing very well. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about your work and, and what you've been doing here today at Chalk. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I've just done a talk on uh, what's known as the death match, the game that Dynamo Kiev players or Kiev players uh, played against Luftwaffe side uh, on the 9th of August, uh, 1942. And well, it's it's a complicated story, but yeah. four of them end up uh, being killed afterwards. The reasons why uh, are very difficult uh, to to sort of piece together. But certainly, the the Soviet propaganda story was they were killed specifically because they'd beaten this, this Luftwaffe team. Uh, I, I think, as I said, yeah. it's a lot more complicated than that. No, I, can, I, can, I, I saw how complicated it was when the talk. But, you know, how, what difficulties did we have then when looking at this period and researching this period? Well, th- that period uh, in Kiev is, is particularly fraught because um, these are Ukrainian players, but they've played for, the, for Dynamo, who are the NKVD side. So they're paid for by the communist state. You know, they're, they're, that's their employer, effectively. I mean, they wouldn't have called it professionalism, but de facto, yeah. that, that's what it is. Um, and at the end of the war, the players who'd been involved, the, people, the players who'd survived, they are really worried this will be perceived as collaboration. And so there's there's a, 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 the leader of another team, a guy called uh, Georgi Shvetsov, who ran a team called Ruk. And he... He was a collaborator, really. I mean, he was he was certainly trying to ameliorate the position, liaise between the Kievan population and the German occupiers. And he gets sent to the Gulag for, I can't remember, 20, 25 years. Okay. So they've got that example there of, you know, maybe playing football against Germans, <laughs> that might look bad in the wrong light. So it, the story is repressed until after Stalin's death. And then once Khrushchev takes power in 53, slowly things liberalise, and I think partly because Khrushchev is Ukrainian, people recognise this could be seen as a as a great propaganda story for Ukrainian communism. And what then happens is you get the reverse. Having been repressed, it then becomes massively embellished. And so you have absurd stories that in this game that the Germans are you know, taking pot shots at the, you know, with rifles at the, <laughs> uh, at the Dynamo players. But clearly that's not true. Clearly that didn't happen. So trying to work out the truth is very, very difficult. And of course now, uh, and really since since the end of communism, since 1990, things have been incredibly difficult because for Ukrainians, these players are Soviet heroes. You know, they were doing it in a red shirt. They were shouting Soviet slogans. They had grown up in the Soviet system. They played for an explicitly Soviet state club. And actually, a lot of the Ukrainian nationalists sided with the Germans. And there's some hor- horrific stories like that. So uh, there's a midfielder called Lazar Kogan who'd run a hardware shop and that was, I was taken off him by the Soviet state. Um, you know, he was nationalised. And he, he thought, oh, the Germans are giving me my shop back. I'll get my business back. And he was Jewish. And he was telling other people, no, no, don't, don't flee. It'd be great. The Germans will, will give us all our businesses back. And, of course, he ends up being, being murdered for being Jewish. You know, one of the 33,700 who died at Baba yeah, It's It's really interesting to see how football is this prism of contradiction between Nazism and Stalinism but also between Ukrainian nationalism and Soviet nationalism but you know football in the Soviet Union seems to be quite a murky business mm. you know, what's the what's the context behind Soviet and, and German football before the war 
Okay, so before the war, you so the Soviets when they uh, when they take power, they set up a, a football league. They, to be honest, not very good at football till the mid thirties. There's a, a Basque touring team in 1936 who are trying to raise funds for the Spanish Civil War for the communist side, or at least for the Basque nationalist side, which I guess at that point yeah, yeah. was the <laughs> Franco side, and therefore the same thing. Um, and they are playing a WM. A WM is you know, Herbert Chapman and Arsenal develops in the late twenties. It takes various forms, but that's sort of the the advanced form of football. And it's when people see this Basque team that they realise, ah, yeah, maybe maybe that is a more sensible way of playing. And certainly at Dynamo in, in Kiev, uh, yeah, they 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 take on that that way of playing. But you have um, the teams are all state uh, institutions. So you have Seska, which is the army team. You have Dynamo, which is the secret police team. You have Torpedo, which is based on the Torpedo Zill car plant. Um, you know, every team has to be backed by one of these state bodies. But of course, the complicating factor in the Soviet Union is you also have Russian teams and Ukrainian teams and Georgian teams. And so you have a Dynamo in Moscow, in Kiev, in Tbilisi, in Minsk, everywhere. And Dynamo Kiev have this, I, mean, I don't think before the war was true, but certainly by the 60s, 70s, 80s, they have this very complicated position of, yes, they are the team of the KGB, they're also the team, team of the Ukrainian nation. And that's a very contradictory position to be in. Uh, Germany, um, German football was always amateur till the war. Um, there was a, a, a sort of an aristocratic belief, I, I guess the sort of thing that inspires the Olympic ideals. And, and to an extent, English football up until the First World War, that really sport shouldn't, you shouldn't be paid for playing sport. That's, that's somehow dirties it. Yeah. It's about, you know, Lenny Riefenstahl doesn't think you should be paid for playing sports. She thinks it should be about the, you know, the glorious celebration of the body. And, and so when the Nazis take over you know, in 1933, they maintain that, that uh, ideology. Um, 34, Germany do pretty well at the World Cup. They, they finish third. Crucially, they beat Austria in the third, fourth place playoff, uh, which is a ridiculous game where both teams turn up wearing white shirts and black shorts <laughs> and both refuse to change. <laughs> And uh, Germany take the lead. They're both wearing white shirts. And the referee goes, look, this is ludicrous. We can't do this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop the game now in Germany have won unless you, Austria, change into red. So they changed. Um, and by 38, they really should have been a challenger at the World Cup. Uh, they had what was called the a team that becomes known as the Breslau Elf, who beat Denmark when Denmark were a decent side. They beat them 8 nil in Breslau, or of Wrocław, as we were you know, in Poland now. Um, but you have the Anschluss. And there's an attempt to marry the Austrian team to the German team. Uh, they don't get on with each other at all. <laughs> oh, understandably, yeah. Uh, they play totally different styles of football. And Sepp Herberger, the coach, who's an amazing figure. Sepp Herberger, who left, I can't remember, I think it's, it's something like 370 files of notes throughout his life. He's you know, on his oh, death. Wow. <laughs> and the war is only mentioned in them. And bear in mind, he's national coach of Germany from roughly 1936. It's slightly unclear when he takes over through to 62, I think. He mentions the war only in the context of, oh, there was an air raid last night. The lads aren't going to be shot for training this morning. <laughs> or, you know, lost sign, so we had to go go to the front. Yeah, he does not talk about the war of politics apart from how it directly impinges on his team selection and his training sessions. And it's, it's interesting how that's how he views that war and how he views his his environment at that time. So how does... And we, you just mentioned he's losing players, but how does the war change the shape of these teams and change the shape of football? Uh, I mean, obviously it changes it massively that uh, Germany comes out of the war. It's you know, divided in four and then in, in two. Um, and it's it's the US sector where football gets up and running quicker. Um, they seem much less concerned by the idea these clubs might have fascist pasts, whereas the French were very, very worried by that. The Soviets as well. The British seem to have taken a fairly pragmatic middle line. Um, and slowly the, in Germany, the, or West Germany rather, the, the national championship is reinstituted. But it's not actually a national league till 1963. And I'm sure that delay is because of the war. In the East, obviously, they have their own championship. But all the teams have to be reformed. Um, which is why I think, for instance, Red Bull Leipzig, who are hated by a lot of German fans as this very artificial construct, as being, you know, Red Bull have... Of, um, have bought the have bought the club, which is not something that happens in Germany. Their fans, I think, are a little bit well 
the communists took over our team and changed its name and changed its identity. How is this different? Um, so that's that's where German football is. Soviet football, um, I don't think the war does change it particularly. Uh, I mean, I think they, they had a had a great team um, at uh, Dynamo Moscow under Boris Akadiev, who was one of the great sort of one of the great pioneers of. of of intermovement of players, the players wouldn't be in fixed positions. They'd be allowed the sort of freedom that is very common today. Yeah. It was unusual then, and he brings that team uh, to to England or to Britain rather. In in uh, I think it's forty five. It might be forty six. I think it's forty five. Very soon after the end of the war, there was a lot of pro Soviet feeling in, in Britain at the time for obvious reasons, and they play in front of huge crowds and they're brilliant. And they, they play in, in Glasgow, they play against Rangers, they play Cardiff, they play Arsenal, I think they play one other game in England, I can't remember where that is. And they're massively popular and they, they, they win. Uh, I think they win every game. They play Chelsea, so that's the other game they play. Um, and this is, seems like this is the football of the future. And then that side, eventually, they go to the Olympics in 52 and it's widely expected they'll win. And they lose to Yugoslavia in the semi-final. Yugoslavia then do what they always do and lose in the final <laughs> to, to the Hungarians, the start of a great Hungary team of the 50s. And that Soviet team, a lot of them are based on what was then called CDKA, well, it become CSKA. Uh, they're blamed for it, and the, the club's disbanded by Stalin. And so it's only yeah. on Stalin's death that a little bit more rationality and uh, sensibleness <laughs> comes into Soviet football. It's, it's interesting to see how the politics of the different regimes in the post-war period shapes the national identity and the, and, and, and the current feeling towards some of these teams. Now, your talk was on the greatest match in World War II. Mm -hmm. How did this match kind of emerge? So, I mean, where, where do you start? The, the <laughs> Germans, having occupied Kiev, decide one of the ways they're going to try and normalise life is to have football at weekends. It's not a league, it's, it's friendlies. And they encourage um, clubs to sort of register themselves. You have a lot of garrison clubs, so there's a Romanian garrison club, a Hungarian garrison club, a German garrison club. You have a team called Ruk, who was set up by a guy called Hyoki Shvetsov. Um, and he had been turned down by Dynamo in 1923. He was very bitter towards Dynamo. But he clearly knew a lot of the players, and he was working to try and liaise between the Cuban population and the German authorities. And he sets up this team. And then the team who, who are key to the story start. Um, they're set up at a bakery. There's a guy called jo Josip Kordik who had fought for the, on the German side in the First World War. He's a Moravian Czech. Couldn't get home. Has a pretty miserable life in the Soviet Union. Obviously, is suspected all the time. And football seems to be one of the few things he does that gives him any pleasure. And he becomes a Dynamo fan. As soon as the Germans get there, he he says, oh, I, actually, I, I don't know all that's about me being Czech. No, no, I'm, I'm an Austrian. <laughs> uh, I'm Volksdeutsch. <laughs> and so we go, OK, you, you can run this bakery then. And this is great for him. He's got a position of authority. He's got a proper salary. Uh, you know, he's not being threatened by the authorities all the time for being born in the wrong place. And he seems to have gathered some cyclists and boxers to work at his bakery, give them accommodation. Then one day he's sitting in a cafe and he sees Mikola Trusevich, the great goalkeeper of Dynamo from before the war. And Trusevich is clearly in a bad way. He's been shot in the leg, trying to defend Kiev. Uh, his house has been bombed or, or you know, hit during the bombardment. And so he's got nowhere to live. He's living on the streets. And he, he rushes out the cafe and sees him and says, yeah, what, are you, what are you doing? I, uh, do you want a job? Do you want to come yeah. and live at the bakery? And Trusevich just said, well, yeah, I, yes, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> and then Trusevich said, yeah, there's other Dynamo players in this position. And the Kordic, this is brilliant. These people he's idolised, he's then they're working for him and he's, he's putting them up. And he gets to chat to them every day. And you can imagine how he gets a kick out of that. And so he then enters them, you know, he registers them, and they start playing games. They, they play against Rook, beat them 7-2. As, yeah, as you'd expect, they're good, good players. They beat these Romanian garrison sides, these Hungarian garrison sides, the German garrison side, at which people start to think, oh, hang on. Yeah, this does feel a bit like the undermensch beating the Ubermensch. Yeah. It doesn't really sit well with us. Well, oh, no, what are we going to do? And the German authorities think, right, we'll bring in this, this crack team called Flakel for the Luftwaffe team. They've got people who had played at a high level, not professionals, but de facto professionals before the war. They play them, start win 5-1. The game's played on a Thursday afternoon. There's not that many people there. I don't know why it's played on a Thursday yeah. afternoon. And within 24 hours, they're putting a poster saying, there's a revenge match on Sunday. Come and watch the revenge match. And even the fact they're using that word revanche, I think is 
really telling. That's really sort of annoyed them. But why they think they're going to win on the Sunday when they've been hammered <laughs> yeah. on the Thursday. Um, and then, you know, who knows what the truth is because, you know, as we said, piecing this together has, has been very difficult. But the referee appears to be an SS officer. He speaks very good German. The Dynamo players find this quite uncomfortable, unsettling. They're asked to give the Nazi salute. Supposedly they refuse. I'm slightly sceptical as to whether they'd have done that, but maybe, I don't know. At half-time, they're 3-1 up, and they're told at half-time, don't win this game, what are you doing? <laughs> and they're told that by Shvetsov, you know, the guy who's liaising. Yeah. And they're told this supposedly by the SS referee. And then the second half, who knows what happens. The stories are massively contradictory. It appears to finish 5-3 to start. It appears the game finishes slightly early. The Klemenko, the young fullback, who scored one of the two goals in the second half, that he takes the ball around the keeper. Rather than putting it in the net, he kicks it back towards the halfway line. I'm sceptical of that. That sounds like something the propagandists would have made up. Yeah. But equally, if you want to make a point of you want us to lose this game and we're not doing it, maybe that is a good way of doing it. And then the propaganda has them being rounded up and, and killed, but that's not really what happened. It's, it's incredibly fascinating how the Germans are trying to use this as a, a way to push their ideological message, but it's just not working out that way. Well, I'm not sure they are, actually. I, I think it's more... It's a bit like in COVID. Um, because the German league returned before the English league, we all started watching German football. We just <laughs> needed football to watch. And people were desperate for football to come back. And you know, footballers had to have special dispensation to be allowed to do their job. And all these you know, COVID protocols were introduced to try and make it safe. But... You know, People were kind of, I think, with a degree of justification, saying, why is this a protected profession? You know, they're not nurses, they're not transport drivers, they're not shop assistants. Do we need footballers? But actually, maybe for a sense of normality, we do. But we got so used to football every weekend that we need to watch it. We need to have that to uh, anchor our conversations, what we talk about, to give us this sort of social media splurge of, of, of stuff to discuss. And, you know, th those first weeks when you had the Bundesliga but not the Premier League, and everybody's suddenly talking about, oh, did you see that Paderborn game? On yeah. Why are we talking about Paderborn? <laughs> but it's something to talk about. And I, I, don't, I don't think the value of that can be, can be overstated. I think that is really important. Yeah. No, no I, I, really like, I really like that point. And I, I certainly remember being guilty watching football from the Faroe, Faroe Islands <laughs> during COVID. So it did, it did provide some kind of light relief, I think. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just it's sort of the, the currency in which everyday transactions of, of social engagement is conducted. So now I've got a final fun question for you, Jonathan. Okay. After I, I love to talk about football, so thank you very much for the opportunity. But we're at Chalk History Festival, uh, and we've, we can hear people making swords, people playing flutes and bagpipes. But what are you most looking forward to experiencing today at Chalk? Well, unfortunately, I'm not here for very long because I, I flew back from the US yesterday. I'm flying out tomorrow oh. morning. But I am going to go and listen to Dan Jackson, who's a mate of mine, a great historian from the Northeast, talking to David Kiniston. So that's the one thing I'm definitely going to after lunch. And then let's, let's see what else I've got time for. But that's the one thing I know I'm definitely doing. Oh, awesome. And then, OK, if we're going, if you're going back to the Euros, mm -hmm. maybe putting you on the spot a little bit, what do you think of England's chances? I mean... <laughs> It's not impossible they win it, but it's very unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, the problem is international tournaments, there is a degree of randomness there. And uh, if you're solid at the back, as France were in 2018, as Portugal were in 2016 particularly, I mean, you look at that Portugal team in 2016, and we were talking about this last week. When Portuguese fans get in from the pub and they want to just slap something on the telly, yeah. do they put on a game in 2016 during Covid we, you know, we were watching you um, you in 96 did they watch you in 2016 because none of those games were any good no. <laughs> you had three draws <laughs> in the group stage they draw against Iceland they, they draw against Hungary 3-3 three, three. and then they they scraped by uh, Poland a terrible terrible game we won on penalties they sort of a functional 2-0 win over Wales the final a drab 0-0 nil goes to extra time they win it 1-0 with a slightly freakish goal from midair um is there much glory in that? Do they remember that fondly? And yet, I suspect if, if England were to do that, yeah. <laughs> we'd be quite happy. Uh, so we got the defensiveness right. You know, only only conceded uh, an XG of 1.1 in the group stage, which is by far the best. But at the minute, the rest looks pretty far from being convincing. And the problem is, you end up talking like this to try and sort of persuade yourself that there is a chance. Yeah. But actually, you you want to plan it. You want to be like Spain in 08 or 10 or yeah. 2012, where... 
you've worked out a philosophy, you've worked out a way of playing, you've developed your players to play that way, you've put it into action, and everybody else has just sort of collapsed in front of you. Um, I guess France have done that to an extent with Clairefontaine. And England, with uh, the elite player performance plan, with the England DNA project, which Southgate was very instrumental in setting up, maybe, maybe they have done that to an extent. But I do feel this one we're sort of clutching straws a bit. Maybe things will fall into place. It's happened for other teams. Yeah. It's not really how you, you should plan a tournament. The, the thought that it would, maybe it'll go right. Yeah, no, I, I, I thoroughly agree with everything there. I, I think I was taking the mick out of someone the other day for doing a 3-0 bet for England to win. And I was I, I just don't think that's happening. <laughs> well, I mean, the problem is there's lots of little fires that have now become one big fire. So the issue of Luke Shaw's fitness and no other left backs, left-footed left backs... It's a problem you can't really blame Southgate for, although I think in retrospect, maybe you could have taken Chilwell. Uh, or you could have devised a way of playing where maybe John Stones had seven in midfield and you didn't need your fullbacks to give you the extra men in midfield. And then you could have had width further forward. But when you haven't done that in a friendly, to suddenly do that in a tournament, I think is a massive risk. And that seems to be all the newspapers are talking about now. Oh, we need to play a 3-4-3 with Bakaya Saka on the left. I mean, it might work, but it is just saying that eight years of planning, we just ripped up and chucked in the air and were hoping... Uh, Maguire not being there I think Gay's played very well but Maguire was an established part of that team he's you know, decent at bringing the ball forward he gives obviously an aerial threat from from you know, from an attacking point of view and England haven't threatened from set plays at all Maguire's absence is clearly part of that I think the not having worked out a way of replacing Calvin Phillips alongside Declan Rice has been a problem the fact that Foden likes to drift in field and you don't have a left footed left back overlapping is an issue Foden's coming into Bellingham's space, who's already in Kane's space. That's a problem. Bellingham has to play deeper, and I don't really understand why that hasn't happened. It's almost like the, you know, the, the nonsense idea of, oh, we should build a team around Bellingham. Building the team around was fine in 1985. It has not been fine since then. It's an, you know, anybody who says that is an idiot. But, you know, just do not know what they're talking about. You do not build a team around one player, unless you're like Liberia with George Weah. But England are not Liberia with George Weah. So... If Bellingham were playing deeper, Kane could drop deeper. There'd be some space for Foden to pull into. Does Bellingham want to do it? Is he prepared to do that? Could you then play Bellingham and Foden centrally if they're playing more of his eights than as a ten? But all the, all these are things that should have been worked out six months ago, not now. Or you can tweak one or two things now to be tweaking five or six. I mean, you know, for instance, Saka has been brilliant for England for three years, but he looks tired. So maybe there is a case now to bring in Cole Palmer. That's the kind of tweak you should be making during the tournament. Not a wholesale change. And, of course, Kane's got a back problem, which for some reason we're not talking about, but he's clearly not fit. Yeah, and, and as an Arsenal fan, you know, I've seen Saka tire yeah. across and these Bellingham three years. Across yeah, across this season as well. But Saka's played too much. He's obviously played too much. You know, he's been playing, you know, 30-odd games, league games a season. Since he was 16 so, as yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, he's played a crazy amount of games, a crazy amount of minutes for how old he is. It's, I mean, I think Mikel Arteta's done a great job at Arsenal, but that is one area where I think... I'm not really sure you've fulfilled your duty of care to a, a young player whose career, I suspect, will not go on much beyond 30 because he will be exhausted. And that's a, that's a fabulous insight. And as an Arsenal fan, I, I completely agree. Now, before we turn this history podcast into a football <laughs> podcast, uh, which I do enjoy anyway, where can people interact with your, your football work online? So I mainly work for The Guardian, so you can find me at The Guardian website, theguardian.com. Um, I'm on The Guardian's Football Weekly podcast uh, fairly regularly. I have my own football history podcast called It Was What It Was, which we've been running for a couple of months now. Um, and that's, you know, if you enjoy this talk about football in Kiev during the Second World War, there's a lot more of that kind of thing, but also more recent stuff. You know, Liverpool in the 80s, United in the 90s. There's a, there's a commercial element and there's yeah. stuff I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, but yeah, hopefully we can, we can manage both. Um, and I've done 12 works of football history plus a football novel on the Soviet Union. And I'm working on a, a history of the World Cup now, which should be out. Uh, this is to mark you up very early. It should be out in September 2025. Oh, amazing. And then how can people gr- uh, go and buy your books? So, I mean, go to Amazon is the easiest thing. Yeah. Or go to a bookshop, which is even better. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming Cheers, on, Jonathan. thank you.